Video 4. It's half past eight. Saturday Night Theatre. We present Ursula Smith with Stephen MacDonald and Roy Boucher in Mary Stewart's Wildfire at Midnight. Adapted for radio by Stuart Hunter. Wildfire at Midnight. Ever's three three seven. Mother? Oh, Jeanetta. Oh, what a lovely surprise. How are you both? Oh, bearing up, thank you. Uh, but what about you? That's really what I'm phoning about. Well, you're not unwell, are you? Oh, no, there's nothing wrong that a short holiday won't cure. Hugo thinks I should take myself off to some quiet spot. I dare say I was looking a bit run down. Well, in that case, the sooner you get away, the better. Uh, when would you thought? The beginning of June, probably. Oh, good. It's a pity, though, you, you miss all the fun of being in town for the coronation. I don't think I'll be altogether sorry to escape from the crowds. You will not be coming down here, of course. Would you mind, dearest, if I went somewhere else for a bit? I thought of the Lake District. No, that's not far enough. Uh, how about Sky? Sky? That could be just what I need. Do you remember where the Dunhills stayed when they were there? Uh, yes, it was the uh, Camus Sunderby Hotel. The what hotel, Mother? Oh, the Camus Pits, as it sounds. Look, have you got a pen? <laughs> the other part is uh, F-H-I-O-N-N-A-R-I-D-H. Do you know, I think I shall go to the, how do you say it? Camus Sunderby Hotel. I know the island like the back of my hand, but they still take my breath away every time. They? The Coolins. Oh. Uh, you couldn't have had your first sight of the hills under better conditions. You're a climber, I take it. Uh, oh, yes, of sorts. Uh, what about you? Have you come for long? A week, possibly ten days, depending on the weather. You're from... London. Ah. Well, you've certainly come to the right place if you want to get away from the crowds. What's that mountain right behind the hotel? That's Blaven. It's what? Blaven. The Blue Mountain in English. Uh, what made you come to Sky? I wanted a complete change. I shall take myself for long walks in the hills. According to the guidebook, there's a lock on the lower slopes of Blaven, is it? Uh-huh. I don't see myself going far beyond that. I'm not likely to come to any harm there, am I? Uh, you'll be staying at the hotel, of course. Forgive me, but haven't we met? I know you, surely. No, we've never met, Miss Mayling. Although, of course, I've often seen you on the stage. Oh, I have a jolly good memory for faces. I still think I've seen you before. Well, I model clothes, if that's any help. Indeed, that's where. You model for Montefiore, don't you? More often than not. My name's Drury, Janetta Drury. I saw your last show, and the one before, and the one before that. Mm, back to the dawn of time, darling, I know. But how nice of you. You must have been in big tales when we did Wild Bells. <laughs> I cut them off early. I had to earn a living. Ah, enter a manservant bearing much-needed drink. Ta. Ah. Thank you. Slant. Uh, what? Slant, my dear. That seems to be what they say for cheers in these parts. Oh, I see. Cheers. What? Hmm? Well, I was about to ask rather rudely, what on earth are you doing here? Resting, my dear. Really resting, not just out of a job. The show came off a week ago. I just read a perfectly divine book about Sky, so here I am. And doesn't Sky live up to the book? In a way. Trouble is you can't really get around. Do you like walking? Rough walking. I do, rather. Well, I don't. And Fergus simply refuses to take the car over some of these roads. Fergus, you're here with your husband. Oh, my dear, no. Fergus is my chauffeur. Marcia, oh, 
I am sorry, Miss Mayling. Marcia, my sweet, please. Who else is staying here? Well, let's see. There's Colonel and Mrs. Cardry Simpson. Let them, but all sweet. I think I saw them come in. Elderly and with an empty creel. That's them, all right. Then there's Mr. and Mrs. Corrigan and Mr. Brain. Not Alistair Brain. A friend of yours. I've met him. He's in advertising. Well, he's with the Corrigan couple. And if ever I could find it in my heart to pity a woman married to a good-looking man, which Hartley Corrigan most certainly is, I'd pity that one. Why? Fish. Fish? Oh, I get it. You mean fishing. Exactly. Morning, noon, and night. And she does nothing but moon about miserably. I believe I may have caught a glimpse of her in the hall when I was registering. She didn't look too happy. Ah, who else have we? Well, just before you join me in here, I noticed two women passing. One was about my own age. The other was much younger. They teach in the same school. I met a man on the ferry. He seems to be staying here. Grant, I think. Ah, that would be Roderick Grant. He practically lives here, I believe. Tallish, nice-looking, with rather gorgeous hair. That's the one. Blue eyes. And how he definitely is interesting. Is it one? I gathered that this Roderick Grant is a fisherman, too. Oh, heavens, yes. But I must say, he's only spasmodic about it. Most of the time he walks, or something. Anyhow, he's never in the hotel. He's a climber. Probably. Oh, there's another climber chap called Beagle. One old Beagle? He's a famous mountaineer. Oh, well, he goes around with another man, a strange little creature called Hubert Hay. Oh, I almost forgot there's another man who got here last night. I have a feeling he writes. Good heavens. We're a positive galaxy of talent, aren't we? <laughs> this other chap's all dark and damn your eyes. But believe it or not, he fishes too. There's only one thing for it, you know. We'll have to take up fishing ourselves. I'm told it's soothing to the nerves. Does your husband fish? Possibly the ring misled you. I'm not married. Oh, sir. Divorced. Oh, <laughs> so am I. Three times, darling. Aren't men stinkers? Mine could be, at times. What was his name? Nicholas. Oh, it's fast. But dinner could be said to be in the offing. Thank heaven, I'm hungry. I must say the view from here really is spectacular. The garden certainly looms. Not any more of that, please. Do you mind? Yes, I'm being a boom. I can't help it, Janetta. That bloody mountain gets me down. Let's just not talk about it. Oh, my God. What's wrong? Is it because... Oh, no, no, it's not you at all. It, it's the man who's just arrived at the front door of the hotel. Ma'am? Yes, I dare say he's your nameless, dark, damn-your-eyes writer. Except that he doesn't happen to be nameless to me. His name is Nicholas Drury. Nicholas Drury? No. You can't mean... Just me. that. My husband as was. This holiday is going to be fun. Janet Drury. Alistair, <laughs> nice to see you again. Where have you been all these years? Oh, well, America, mostly. Well, Nick didn't tell me you were joining him here. Oh, Lord, Alistair, don't tell me you don't know. Know what? We got a divorce. When? Ages ago. You really haven't heard? No, not a word. Oh, well, these things happen. It just didn't work out. I'm sorry, Janet. But, uh, what are you doing in this part of the world? I'm on holiday. Oh, Oh, by the way, have you met the Corrigans? No, not yet. Well, then I must introduce you. Oh, my name's Brooke, Alistair. Not Drury. Do remember. Not to worry. Uh, Hartley, Alma, this is a friend of mine, Janet Brooke. Janet, Mr. and Mrs. Corrigan. Oh, how do you do? I gather you and Miss Melling have already introduced yourselves. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to desert you two at dinner. Miss Brooke and I have known each other a longish time, and we've a lot to talk about. Is this your first visit to Sky, Miss Brooke? Yes, it is. I'm sure it won't be your last. There's Nick at the foot of the stairs. Oh, yes, uh, Nick. <clears throat> Hi, Nick. Hello. Look who's here. You do remember Janet Brooke? Janet Brooke? Uh, yes, of course I remember her. Hello, Janetta. How are you? Well, thank you. And you? Very fit, thanks. Another old friend, darling. Yes, Marcia. It seems my London life's catching up with me even here. I do beg your pardon. I was daydreaming. I'm sorry if I startled you. Would you like some coffee? Yes, please. Black or brown? A uh, black stick. Why should you wait on me? Oh, nobody serves the coffee. They bring it all in on a huge tray and we each get our own. Oh, thanks for telling me. I shall... No, let me this time. Black, you said. Please. 
I put a little sugar in. I hope you that... are kind. You've just come, haven't you? Yes, this afternoon. Won't you sit down? I'm Roberta Thines, by the way. And I'm Jeanetta Brooke. We're walking, Marion and I. That's Marion. Marion Bradford over there with the Who Done It. Actually, we're sort of climbing. Are the Sky Hills the kind you sort of climb? Well, Marion's a climber, and I'm not. So we're scrambling, which is a halfway solution. But I'm dying to learn. I'd like to climb every peak in the Cullens, including the inaccessible pinnacle. <laughs> a thoroughly unworthy ambition. Unworthy, Mr. Grant? Yes. That from you, of all people. Why unworthy? I'm sorry, I forgot you two haven't met. We have, in fact, on the ferry. Why unworthy, Roberta? I'll tell you. Just look at the hills. They've been there countless ages. But you, who've lived out a puny 20 years, talk about scaling them as if they were... Mole Hill. <laughs> <laughs> More of a challenge, surely. Mere men, or worse still, mere women, pitting themselves against the giants of time. Everest, for example. Exactly. How do you rate their chances, Mr. Grant? I think they're going to make it. Did I hear someone mention Everest? Any news yet? No, nothing further. Have you met Beagle? No. Oh, well, in that case. Uh, Ronald, come and join us. Well, he really can speak with some authority on climbing. Jeanette Brooke, this is Ronald Beagle. I did, yes. I did, I just stuck my neck out by saying that I reckon the Everest chaps are likely to pull it off this time. Would you agree, Ronald? <laughs> Depends on the weather. And, uh, going on the last report I heard, they're going to have it better than we look like having. Oh, no. And I wanted to start really climbing tomorrow. Quite determined to conquer the Fuldins, then. Quite, Mr. Gardner. Where do you intend to start, Miss Sun? Uh, Marion, what do you think? The best climbs are brew up in a banister and brew up in a free, but they're too far away. Guardsman's within easy reach, but of course it's just plain dull. Oh, Marion, I'm sure Mrs. Corrigan's right. It doesn't look hard, and there must be a wonderful view. There's a wonderful view from every single peak of the Coolins. Having climbed them all, Miss Bradford. If you mean do I know what I'm talking about, the answer is yes. As this discussion seems to have become a free-for-all, do you think I might... My dear Hubert, we are all ears. If I were you, Miss Simon... I've already I... made up my mind where we're going. We're going up Blarven. You did say Blarven, Miss Bradford. I did, Mr. Beagle. Is that, um, quite wise? It's easy enough from this end. Uh, quite, but, uh, well, if the weather is bad... Oh, a spot of rain won't hurt us. And if the mist threatens, we won't go. Look, isn't it time someone broke the hoodoo on that blasted mountain? Now I must get some fresh air. It's so stuffy in here. You're coming, Roberta. Okay, Marion. I think I'll follow Miss Bradford's example and have a walk. I wonder if you'd care to join me, Mrs. Corrigan. I'd have liked to very much, Miss Brooke, but... Uh, I've had all the exercise I need for one day. If you don't mind, Miss Brooke, I too could do with stretching my legs. Or would you prefer to be alone? I should be glad of your company, Mr. Grant. If you want to climb Unstrown, we'd better keep to the Blarven side of the glen. There's a bog farther on near the river. It isn't too pleasant. Even the deer avoid it. Uh, not walking too fast for you, am I? No. Is this your home, Mr. Grant? Oh, no. Well... My father was minister of Ochlechty, a little lost village at the back of the north wind. Uh, do you know it by any chance? I'm afraid not. Oh, you don't have to apologize. That's where I learned my mountain worship. I had no mother. My father was a well, remote kind of man who had very little time for me. It was miles to school, so as often as not, I just ran wild on the hills. You must have been a very lonely little boy. Hmm. I, I don't think I felt lonely until an uncle died and left us a lot of money. After that, I was sent to a public school. Bad luck. I hated it. And now you've spent your time climbing. Oh, pretty well. I travel a bit, but I always seem to end up here in May and June. Here, watch your step now. What? What was it? A cock grouse. Look. That's terrific. Larvan, at its most impressive. I wonder if those two fool women will rarely go up there tomorrow. Is it a bad climb? Well, there are several nasty places, even there. Miss Bradford said she knew her way about. Yes, yeah, she did, didn't she? Mr. Grant? Hmm? What did Miss Bradford mean about a hoodoo on Blarven? What's wrong with it? Why does everyone shy off it as they do? 
Don't say you haven't noticed it. You don't know? Of course I don't know. I've only just arrived. Murder's what's wrong. Murder? Two and a half weeks ago. Happened on the 13th of May. A local girl was murdered on... On Blavin? Oh, no. On Blavin. Who was the girl? And who did it? We still don't know who did it. The girl's name was Heather McRae. Her father does some gillying for the hotel folks in the summer season. His crofts three or four miles up the strath. It, it seems that Heather was keeping company with a lad from the village, one James Farland. And so, when she took to staying out a bit later in the long summer evenings, her folks didn't worry about it. They thought she was with Jamesy. But she wasn't. And Jamesy says not. But then, in the circumstances, he would. And if it wasn't Jamesy, who could it have been? Jamesy says that he and Heather had a quarrel. Yes, yes, he admits it quite openly. He says she'd begun to avoid him. And when he tackled her about it, she flared up and said she was going to go in with a better chap than he was. A, a gentleman, Jamesy says she told him. A gentleman from the hotel. But that doesn't mean that the man from the hotel was necessarily the murderer. Mm, no, I suppose not. But what we do know is that Heather McRae went out on the evening of May the 13th to meet a man. She told her parents she had a date. On Blavin, you said? Yeah. This bit isn't nice, but I'd, uh, I'd better tell you. At about midnight that night, some men were out late on Loch Scarveg, approaching sea trout, I expect. Suddenly, they saw what looked like a great blaze of fire halfway up Blavin, and they decided to investigate. And found? Well, by the time they reached it, the fire was out, and it was only the tongue of smoke licking around the rock that guided them to it. They found a whitish ledge, easy enough to get to, with the remains of charred driftwood and birch, and heather blackened and, it seemed, deliberately scattered all over the rock. Lying in the middle of the blackened patch was Heather McRae's body, oh. flat on its back. Could I have one of your cigarettes, please? I don't seem to have any on me. Yes, of course, here. Thank you. A light? Yes, thanks. <clears throat> Do you want me to go on? I might as well know the lot, mightn't I? She wasn't very much burned, and she'd been murdered before she was laid on the fire. Her throat had been cut. Oh, dear God. She was fully clothed, and she was lying quite peacefully, it seemed, with her hands crossed on her breast. The oddest thing, though, w was that she was barefooted and all her jewellery had been taken off. Jewellery? Oh, not stolen. That was all there in a little pile in the corner of the ledge. The shoes, leather belt, all the ornaments she'd been wearing, a ring, cheap bracelet, even a couple of hair slides. And, um... Oh, yes, and, and a brooch. It's odd, don't you think? And the police? Do they favour this Jamesy person or the gentleman from the hotel? Mm, God knows. Well, now perhaps you see why the nerves of your fellow guests are a little bit on edge. Yes, I do. I also understand why, whenever I mentioned Blavin, people reacted so strangely. I'm surprised that Major Persimmon didn't warn you guests of what was going on. I could hardly expect Persimmon to ruin his season by warning off intending guests. Well, I suppose not. Just tell me this. Mm -hmm. Which gentlemen were staying in the hotel on May the 13th? Uh... Oh, all those who are here now, with the exception of Miss Mayling's chauffeur. And which of you has an alibi? Uh, none of us that I know of. Colonel Cardry Simpson and Major Persimmon are vouched for by their respective wives, but that doesn't count for all that much, of course. But Corrig and, and Brain were out fishing on Loch At midnight? And quite a lot of people do just that thing, you know. Then they were together? No. Now, they're separated to fish different beats of the river after eleven. And they made their way back to the hotel separately in their own time. Mrs. Corrigan says her husband got in well before midnight. Did he let himself into the hotel? It's open all night. How convenient. And Mr. Hay, what about him? In bed. A very difficult alibi to break. Or to prove. It is, if one happened to be alone in it. My alibi happens to be the same. What's that? A can? That? Oh, no, no, that's a bonfire. A, a bonfire? Yes. It's for the local coronation celebrations. Oh. They've been building it for weeks back. Oh. Yeah, let's press on. Those are the lights of the hotel. It isn't as far away as you think. Oh, good. I suddenly realize that I'm tired, so I'm going to have a bath and turn in.
Janet. Oh, oh, poor Alistair. Please stop shining that torch in my face. I'm sorry, but what on earth are you doing down here at this time of the night? You're just about startling me out of my wits. Oh, you can imagine how I felt. Well, I was trying to cause as little disturbance as possible. I wish this hotel didn't have a blackout from midnight on. <laughs> well, you're in the Highlands, remember. Our host doubtless feels he's doing us proud by having a generator installed. At least it lets us have light at the touch of a switch up to the time when all decent folk should be abed. Don't forget your book when you go upstairs. You've been fishing, I suppose. Yes. Any luck? Mm, pretty fair. But Hart caught a beauty. Hart? Mm. Oh, Hartley Corrigan. Oh, where's he got to? To his bed, I should think. He came back a good two hours ahead of me. I just had some good risers, so I decided to stay on. Uh, strictly illegal, you know, so don't give me away. But that can't be right. What can't? I'm sure I heard him minutes before you came in. Someone was out there in the porch. They messed around for a bit and went away. Mm. Oh, that would be Jamesy you heard. Jamesy? Yes, Jamesy Farlane. He was with us, but I told him not to wait for me. He had the longest way to go, you see. And then it would be him I caught a glimpse of. I went to the window and I saw someone striding along the road. Yes, that would be Jamesy. Well, did you think it was a burglar? But we don't have to worry about such urban horrors here, Janet. No, only murderers. Who told you? Roderick Grant. I see. Worried? Naturally. Well, the police are still working on it, and they don't let up, you know. Alistair, do you think Jamesy Farland did it? Or do you think it's someone staying here? I just don't know. When I came in, I asked you a question which you still haven't answered. What brought you down here at this late hour? I'd remembered I'd left my handbag where I'd been sitting before I went for a walk. By the time we got back, I'd other things on my mind, so I forgot to pick it up. Well, it would have been perfectly safe till morning. But I needed it, Alistair. In the middle of the night? Yes, my tablets were in it. Tablets? I turned in quite early, but I thought I was never going to get to sleep. However, I must have dozed, then bang, I was wide awake again with a thumping headache. Oh, poor you. I wasn't really sorry to be awake. I'd had a horrible nightmares. Fire seemed to be the theme. Fire at midnight. On Glavon. Then I lay thinking about a gentleman from the hotel. So you crept down here and were scared stiff by me. Too bad, Janet. I'd been frightened before that. There was the prowler in the porch. But I was upset anyway. Mm, understandably. As Grant had No, seemed not just a to... murder, Alistair. As I was tiptoeing along the corridor, I heard voices coming from one of the bedrooms. Marcia Mailings. A woman's voice and a man's. Now, Janet, you're a big girl. You know that sort of thing goes on, especially when there's someone like the mailing around. Earlier on, I'd seen her and Nicholas in the corridor, and they weren't just discussing the weather. Now, that doesn't prove that it was Nick who was in her bedroom. And in any case, He's Janet... no longer my husband, so what he does is no concern of mine. Is that what you were about to tell me? I think you should go back to bed, my dear, and try to get some sleep. Take a couple of your tablets. <laughs> know something? I've just realised my headache's back. Brooke. I believe you said you would like to try your hand at fishing. Yes, I did. But I think I might wait a day or two. No, just as you like, of course. But you'd maybe care to fix up a time with uh, Duke McRae here. What about Wednesday, then? Ah, uh, Wednesday's a free day, so it'll be suiting fine. Where shall I put you down for, Dugo? Uh, the upper beat, Major, and now if you'll excuse me, I'll be on my way or I'll be late for the trip. Uh, good day to you, miss. Uh, good day, Major. Good day, Dugo. I wonder if I have time for a breath of air before I go through to the dining room. There's no hurry, Miss Brooke. Mr. Brooke, my name's Hay, Hubert Hay. How do you do, Mr. Hay? I hope you don't mind my speaking to you, but the fact is, I want to ask a favour. Yes? Yes, you see, I'm a writer. I'm a writer of travel books, Miss Brooke. That's why I'm here. I see, collecting material. Yes, I go for walks and then write about them. How very original. Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I shall look out for your books, Mr. Hay. I'll send you one. That would be most kind of you. I've been looking at these, Miss Brooke... I pinched them from the lounge, a couple of dotties. I've a photographic memory, Miss Brooke. Have you? How extremely... As soon as I clapped eyes on you last night, I knew I'd seen the face before in something I'd leafed through recently. So I did a little bit of research. It is your photo that's in these, isn't it? <laughs> Full marks, Mr. Hay. I take photographs for my books. 
I thought if I took a picture of the cool inns, I'd like to put a lady in the foreground. Well, of course you may photograph her, Mr. Hay. That's very kind of you. If it clears up, how about this afternoon on Skirmish Street with the cool inns behind? It's a date, then. I can't begin to tell you how grateful it I am to... It is a pleasure. But will the fee you've taken be enough? Oh, yes, thank you. Miss Brooke, would you take it amiss if I said something to you? Of course not. You're here, on Sky, I mean, solo, aren't you? Yes, I am. Then don't go out alone with anyone, Miss Brooke. It isn't safe. You don't mind my saying so? No, I don't mind. Funny, though. Funny, peculiar. What is? I expect you know that Heather McRae claimed to have been associating with one of the gentlemen from the hotel. That means, of course, that one of them could have been her murderer. I know that, Miss Brooke. Oh, the, the whole thing's damnable. That girl was only 18. It was actually her birthday. It upset me a lot, Miss Brooke. You see, I knew her. Well? Oh, no, no, not intimately, as you might say. I'd stopped at the McRae's Croft a couple of times and she'd made me a pot of tea. She was a pretty youngster and full of life. You didn't get any hint of who it was from the hotel that she was going with. Oh, but that's a silly question. If you'd had any notion of who it was, you'd have told the police. You're right, but... But? Oh, nothing, really. There's something at the back of your mind, Mr. Hay. She did drop a hint, didn't she? A very little one. I told her that I was writing a book, of course. And then I asked if there wasn't still a bit of witchcraft going on in the island, like there used to be. Suddenly she shut up like a clam and pretty near hustled me out of the kitchen. Witchcraft? That's absurd. Absurd, no doubt. But I can't help having a feeling about this murder. It must all have been carefully planned, you see. There were branches of birch wood and a big chunk of oak, hardly charred, and a, a lot of that dry fungus, algorithm it's called, that you find on birch trees. Oh, God. Then, when he was ready, he got the girl up there. There was the fire and the shoes and things in a neat pile, and the girl laid out with her throat cut and her hands crossed on her breast, and ash on her face like... like a sacrifice. But only a madman. Oh, whoever it did it must be crazy, and yet most of the time seem as sane as you or me. So I wouldn't go for a walk with anyone if I were you. I won't, I promise. In fact, I'm beginning to think I might go back to London. It wouldn't be a bad idea at that. And now I'm... I'm sure you'll be wanting to get back to the hotel. I say we're a bit thin on the ground, aren't we? Claimers not back yet? They weren't in the dining room. Well, I hope there's nothing you miss, Mrs. Oh, woman, she shouldn't have gone climbing on a day like this. Coffee us. Do you mind clearing the table, Janet? The tray's heavier than you It's only that awful Thanks. woman hasn't gone and done a silliness just to impress that Do you that think she'd do anything rash, Mr. Grant? Miss Bradford doesn't take kindly to advice, but she's actually a very accomplished climber. I'm sure she wouldn't take any chances with a mere beginner like Miss Symes. Well, after all, Ronald Beagle set out to climb Scorden and Geelan, and he certainly wouldn't have gone in unfavourable conditions. He's not back either, Mr. Grant. Uh, where's your husband, Mrs. Corrigan? He? Oh, he went out walking. Yes, we set out to walk up to the ridge for the view over Loch Slappen. I brought Mrs. Corrigan back, but Hart decided to go a bit further. Uh, did you see any sign of the two women then, on Blavin? No, we didn't, but we saw someone. I believe it was you, Nicholas, in the distance. No, I wasn't on Blavin, so I saw nothing of them either. I think I'll have a word with Persimmon. They may have told him that they intended being late. Where did you go today, Marcia? To Four Tree, darling. I got some marvellous tweed, sort of purple and... Ah, our dear Roderick is returning to our midst. I'll show you later. Roderick, darling, what did the Major say? That there's no earthly reason for undue anxiety, but... But? I, I don't much like the look of that sky. You're not damn music. The Colonel's determined not to miss the latest about Everest. Oh, he's really rather a dear. I'd hate him to be disappointed. But, you know, I'd be honest sort of feeling about Everest. I believe I'd be almost sorry to hear that the summit has been reached. Really? I've always thought oh. of it as a sort of remote, white, unattainable fastness. Immaculate, as it were. Exactly. I think it'll be rather a pity to see human footprints in the snow. Oh, I didn't know you had this vein of poetry in you, Giannetta. You appear to have developed quite a flair for overhearing what wasn't intended for your ears. Watch it, Nicholas. I didn't. I don't think you know Miss Brooke well enough to make such a personal remark. 
You know, Grant, I'm not sure that I'm all that much interested in what you think. Unless I'm mistaken, our friend Beagle is returning to base. Alone? Yes, alone. That's strange. What is Nicholas? Well, he's coming down the glen from the loch. I was under the impression that he was going up Skuernangelian. That being so, wouldn't it have been easier for him to come down the west side of the glen? Well, it's certainly a shortcut, but the going's terrible. Anyhow, he'll be here in a matter of minutes, so we'll know then if you saw any sign of the two women. We were all pinning our hopes on your having caught a glimpse of them, Beagle. So when you told us you hadn't... Oh, here's Major Fitzgerald. Maybe... Good one. Can I have your attention for a moment? Now, I don't want to be an alarmist, but, well, I think we'd better go out and look for them. Your husband, Mrs. Colligan, has just returned, and Dougal McRae is with him. They saw nothing of the two ladies when they were coming through the glen. Can we be certain they went up, Bluff? Certain. Can we be as certain as all that, Major? I mean, we know that that's what Miss Bradford planned to do, but they might have changed their mind. They went up Blarvin, all right. They were seen on it. Seen? When? Whereabouts? At the Spooten Do. My God, man. The Black Spud's no place for a beginner. Black Spud? Are you sure, Pursuit? Yes, I'm sure, Mr. Beagle. Who saw him, though? Dougal McRae. He saw them making for the gully at about four o'clock. All three of them. All three? Well, Dougal is positive there were three. Yet everybody's back here. That's odd, isn't it? Well, perhaps the third member of the party was a local, someone they'd arranged to act as a guide. They set off without one, Drury. Gentlemen, could you be ready in ten minutes? My wife is preparing coffee and sandwiches for us to take with us. Uh, couldn't we help Mrs. Persimmon? Oh, that would be very good of you, Mrs. Corrigan. Gianetta, shall we... Gianetta? Sorry, Marcia, I was thinking. And about something distinctly ghastly, to judge by your expression. About Dougal McRae's story. Three times, Marcia, three. I wonder if the third could have been... Oh, James E. Farland. Why him, Gianetta? What would he have been doing with them? I don't know. I don't know, Marcia. That's what I find so worrying. Mind if I join you, Marcia? Where are the others? Gone upstairs. I thought you'd be in here, so I bought a drink for us both. Oh, you perfect angel. Oh, isn't it an utterly foul night? It certainly is. Oh, thanks. Cheers. Gianetta, do you believe there's a hoodoo on that mountain? Lava? Oh, of course not. The women will turn up all right. But that other climber... Whoever it was, he certainly wasn't a ghost. That Roberta child's rather sweet. Pathetic, too, in a way. The other I find pathetic. Frustrated, my dear. She's in love with Roderick Grant, you know. Oh, nonsense. <laughs> I think I shall go to bed shortly. I do likewise. Janetta? Yes? Would you like to see the piece of tweed I bought? Yes, I would. Just a sec, I find the switch. Ah! Marcia, for God's sake, what's the matter? The bed! Look! The bed! But it's just a doll, Marcia. Its throat's been cut, and there's ash scattered over it. The murderer's been here! Morning, Miss Brooke. What news, Major? Oh, no, I'm afraid. I just phoned the local rescue team, and we should all be out again by nine. I'd like to help. Well, you and Mrs. Culligan could tackle the area of Scree and Heather bordering the Black Spout. And we're leaving at nine? That's right. Now, if you'll excuse me, I have things to see to. Doesn't the hotel look far away from here? And Miss Mailing's rolls. I suppose it would have been too much to expect her to come along with us, but surely she could have allowed her chauffeur to join in the search. Every available man is. She's leaving. Leaving? She's returning to London. I can't pretend that I'm broken-hearted to see her go. You'd understand how I feel about her if you were a married woman, Janetta. Hartley's been following her around like a lapdog ever since she came, and I've been made to feel and look a fool. Why should he be allowed to get away with it? Do you or do you not wish to keep your husband, Alma? Of course I want to keep him. Then let him be. If you want him, then you must shut up. I oh, can't. Well, we're getting out of touch with the others. Let's get going. Give me a hand, Janet. That's right. Over this way. Not too near the edge. Oh. They'll get to them soon, if Dougal was right. But, Alistair, they can't still be alive. Well, they could be if they managed to creep into shelter. Do you 
really believe there were three of them, Alistair. Dougal McRae isn't given to flights of fancy. Are any of the local men missing? I'm told not. Then the third climber must be someone from the hotel. Yet no one's missing from there either. Exactly so. And if no one from the hotel reported the accident, then it means... Just that. Oh, you've made it, Miss Brooke. Good for you. <laughs> Just. <laughs> what happens now, Mr. Grant? If Dougal McRae was right, and they're starting to work their way across the spot, then the first move is to do likewise. Did you get this far last night? Uh, yes, but it was dark by then. Oh. It makes me dizzy just to look down there. Is it a very bad place to climb? It's bad enough for anyone with a bit of experience, but for a beginner, sheer lunacy. Can the men get down into the gully if, if they have to, Mr. Grant? Oh, yes. Beagle and Rodri McDowell are prepared to go. Look, the others have begun to rope themselves together. Yeah, I'd better join them. It looks as though someone's had the bright idea of searching the hillside and scree on this side of the gully. What shall I do? Wait here, if you don't mind. If they find them injured, you might be able to help. Uh, it looks as though Mr. Beagle's worked round to the far side of that overhang and, and Roderick's up to, onto the ledge he was on. He ain't been moving up any minute now. Maybe they've seen something down below. Uh, maybe, but I hope they had sense enough not to let the lassie try that place. They do, cool. Wasn't it you who said that there were three climbers? Aye, there were three, sure enough. And the third one, was it a man or a woman? Well, at that distance I couldn't be sure, but I could see that one of them had a red jacket on. Miss Symes had a red anorak. Roderick McDowell's pointing. He's seen something. Oh, God, no, please. Please let them both... Uh, steady, Miss Snow, steady. It won't be long now till we know. I can't bear not knowing. I'm going to join the main party. Put the stretcher down for a minute, lads. Oh, my God! Would you look at that? I'm looking, Bill. And I wish I didn't see what I see. What is it, Major? We know she's dead, poor soul. So there can't be anything worse. She fell from that slab. The rope's still around her body, or at any rate, part of it. It broke, you mean? The rope was cut. Cut clean through. I don't understand, Major. Oh, it's easily enough understood, Mrs. Corrigan. Someone cut the rope deliberately, and Miss Bradford fell to her death. Murder? What What about Roberta Symes? Uh, she hasn't been found yet, Giannetta. Miss Brooke. Janet. What on earth are you doing up here alone? You should have gone back to the hotel with the others. Tomorrow, bells will ring out for the coronation, and bonfires will be lit. Bonfires, Roderick. The children have been building for weeks back, prepared for a celebration, not for... A sacrificial rite. I know how you feel. Oh, you look exhausted. Please take my advice. Go back to the hotel. But we've got to find Roberta. Another night on the hill. I doubt if another night's going to make any difference to her, Janet. She must be alive, Roderick. Don't you see? If she'd fallen into the gully with Miss Bradford, she'd have been found. Dougal McRae said she could have been stuck higher up on a ledge or something. There must be places near the top of the gully. We've combed the upper gully twice over. There was no sign of her, Janet. She must be somewhere. She must be hurt. Or well, she would have answered you. And if she was hurt, she couldn't have gone far unless... Roderick, you saw Marion's climbing rope. It was cut. Not a shadow of doubt, I'm afraid. That can only mean one thing, can't it? Yes. Murder, again. Yet Dougal swears there was a third climber there. If he is to be believed. Oh, I think he is. If anyone in this world said dependable, I'd say it was Dougal McRae. If there wasn't a third person there, then it was Roberta who cut the rope, and that's fantastic. Oh, but what is it? it? You can't possibly be. She was a beginner. If, if Miss Bradford fell and the girl thought she was pulling her down after her, she could have easily got into a panic and... I can't accept that, and neither can you. Ah, uh. No, no, I, I can't. But it's a possible theory. So the third climber cut the rope. He was there when Marion Bradford fell. And now Roberta can't be found. Look, Janet. Beagle and McDowell are coming back up from the hotel. They may have heard something. The others are cutting across to meet them. Can you assure me that each of those caves and fissures was searched by at least two of you? What exactly are you suggesting, Brain? 
My question was put to Beagle, not you, Grant. I, however, have just put one to you. What are you suggesting? I overheard your brain, and I think it was a pretty rotten thing to imply. But he's right, you know. It could quite easily be one of us. But why should it be in the murderer's interest to continue to conceal the second body after the first had been discovered? It would certainly be in the murderer's interest to be the first to find her if she were alive. But he could silence her. But he didn't. Every crevice in that gully was searched solo and otherwise by all of us. All right, all right, forget it. I suppose I'm a bit on edge. And we all. She and her take her back to the hotel at once. I can't, Nicholas. I can't give up yet. I couldn't bear having nothing to do but wait and listen with the Cowdery Simpsons for the latest news of the Everest climbers. Well, Drew is right, Miss Brooke. You should get back to rest. I'm trying to find some way of taking your mind off this unfortunate business. <laughs> By the way, since your mention of Everest reminds me, they've done it. <laughs> you hear that, you chaps? The news came through a short time ago. They've reached the summit. Now, see here, Gianetta. Leave her alone. What the hell do you mean? What I said, Drury. I'm no use here, so I'm going back to the hotel now. I'll pack the flasks and mugs and take them down. Are you... you're quite sure? Yes, I'll be all right. This picnic basket's not at all heavy. You go and help the others. And Roderick... Yes, Janet? Please find her, won't you? Oh, must eyes on ground. Mustn't trip. Break ankle. Leg. A leg like Roberta. Marion. God, no. Oh, please. Not storm again. About a lying cold. Just bees. Carrying smell. Smells. Smells of what? Heather. Peat. Bog myrtle. Something else. What else? Wood smoke. Smoke. Bonfire. Yes. Bonfire lit. Flames. Rising. Oh. Oh, it's coronation. No. No. Too soon. Kaya, Kaya, Robert, Robert, Robert! Mud, pull her off! Oh, thank God, come here, help me, please! Oh, Are you all right, Mush? Yes, yes, I'm a fire! It's Robert! Shh, 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 shh. Let me know, lass. You're safe uh, now. You're safe. Uh, Mr. Corrigan. Is she dead? It's not Roberta Sines. It's Beagle. And someone has cut his throat. <laughs> Miss Brooke, is it not? Yes. I'm Inspector Mackenzie, and this is Sergeant Munro. Uh, draw up a chair for Miss Brooke, Hector. Yes, sir. Well, now, Miss Brooke. I've jotted down one or two wee bits of information. Uh, maybe we can check it. I'd be glad to help, Inspector. You are Miss Brooke, of course? Yes. Uh -huh. You arrived here on Saturday afternoon? Yes. Uh, before you came here, had you heard anything about the murder of Heather McRae? No. Not even read about it in the papers? Not that I recollect. Mm, now, I understand it was you who found Mr. Beagle's body on the bonfire last night. I was first on the scene, but I don't know who pulled him off the fire. When was it you first noticed that the fire was burning? Not until I was quite near. I'd been aware, subconsciously, of the smell of wood smoke in the air. Then when I looked up, I saw the flames. And realized someone had lit the bonfire. That's right, Inspector. Then? I saw a shadow, like a man's, near it. I take it you didn't recognize him? No. No! Was he carrying or holding a body, then? Oh, no, he was just moving about on the fringe of the smoke. It was billowing here and there, you know, as the breeze caught it. I screamed and ran towards the bonfire. I saw there was something, a body, on top of it. I was trying to reach it before the flames did when the murderer attacked me. Uh, in actual fact, it was James E. Farlin who grabbed you. Well, I know that, surely. Uh, now, let's get it right. You realize, no doubt, that Mr. Beagle cannot have been killed long before you found him. You met or passed no one at all on your way down. Not a soul. So, the last time you saw Mr. Beagle alive was when the group split up for the final search last night. I... Are you allowed to ask a leading question, Inspector? Now, did you? Yes. Did you see which way he went? Downhill. Alone? Yes. Sure? Quite sure. I see. Now, let's 
get back to the bonfire, shall we? You ran towards it, screaming. There was an answering shout from close behind, I think you said. Yes. Did you recognize the voice? No, not at the time. But later, I assumed it was Alistair, uh, Mr. Brain, who shouted, because it was he who pulled James E. Farlin off me. He must have got there pretty quickly. Uh, Mr. Alistair Brain, then, was the first on the scene. And there was Dougal McRae, too. Who else, Miss Brooke? Uh, Mr. Corrigan. He dragged the body off uh, he and Alistair may have come down the hillside together. Ah, uh, that they didn't. They arrived independently. Who else was there? So far as I know, Inspector, no one else. Mm-hmm, just so. You uh, booked your room, Miss Brooke, in the name of Drury, Mrs. Nicholas Drury. That is my name. Then why did you change it in the visitor's book almost as soon as you got here? And why have you and your husband been at such pains to behave as though you were comparative strangers to one another? Because he's not my husband. We were divorced some time ago. I didn't know he was here, and when I saw him that evening, I was horribly embarrassed. I understand. But to avoid awkwardness all round, I changed my maiden name. I'm sorry if I've distressed you, Miss Brooke, but uh, you have been very helpful. But why all this questioning, Inspector? You've got the murderer. Got the murderer? James E. Farlan, of course. He was at the bonfire and he attacked me there. What more do you want? A bit more, Miss Brooke. Farland's story is that he was near the foot of Aunt's throne when he saw the bonfire go up. He came back up the slope as fast as he could and uh, was just about at the top when he heard you scream. Then you came running and so he says, flung yourself at the fire. He thought you were going to get burned, so he grabbed you and hauled you back. You struggled like mad and you both fell to the ground. Uh, wasn't that his way of attack, though? Aye, that's right, Inspector. Any comment, miss? Only that it might be the truth. Aye, so it might. Especially as Dougal McRae was with them at the time. Well, that's all for now, Miss Brooke. Uh, you'll be uh, about all day, I take it? I'll be on the hill myself, Inspector. There's still someone missing, you know. I hadn't forgotten. Hello, Mr. Hay. Hello there. Doesn't this sunshine make a difference? Yesterday, under that lowering sky, it, it seemed the right sort of setting for a tragedy, but today... And yet Roberta Symes' body is somewhere up here. Well, we can't be sure that she's dead. After two nights and a day, she must be. But we've still got to find her, if only to help the police hunt down this madman. You're convinced that he's insane? Well, only a maniac would go in for two elaborate ritual killings. He must be caught, Mr. A. He will be, I'm sure. Ah, looks as though those chaps seem to have abandoned the Black Spout for the time being. Do you, do you suppose they found her? Doesn't look like it. I'd better get across. Coming, Miss Brooke? No, I'll carry on on my own. In which direction? Up by the Black Spout. But that area's had a pretty thorough going over. Have you ever had the feeling that although others have looked and looked for something and failed to find it, you simply must satisfy yourself that it isn't there? Yes, I have. Well, don't you get lost. I'll try not to, Mr. Hay. Oh, oh an idiot to come here. I should have joined Melon. Rest. No, not again. Keep on going. What? Gleaming long roots. Shining like silver. Brooch. I'm sure I've seen one like that before. I saw someone wearing one exactly. Others have given up so useless for me, Serge. But must carry on till I drop. Ridge. Can't possibly. It's too narrow. Must. Must. Roberta could.
Roberta? Roberta? A cave. A little cave. Oh, Roberta. Roberta. Child, child, you're safe now. You're safe now. Who's that? My God, you found her. Oh, Roderick, thank heavens. Oh, what a fright I got when I heard your footsteps. Yes, I found her, and she's alive. Alive? Yes, yes, she is. I heard her moaning. Yes, yes, she's alive, but only just, I'd say. I'll stay with her, Roderick. You go and get the others. You'll go far faster than I could. Uh, Janet, I left my haversack at the other end of the ledge. My brandy flask's in the pocket. Fetch it, will you? Mm, okay. Uh, uh, did, did you catch what she said? It sounded like Marion killed. It was Roderick. I think she knows who who did it. You're right. And by heaven, she's going to stay alive till she tells us. Get that brandy, please. I'll try and ease her into a less cramped position. Yeah. Oh, once she's had a sip of brat, that brandy, we can get it over her throat. You'll get along to the end of the ledge and yell bloody murder till someone comes. Then if you don't like the look of whoever comes, you'll just do bloody murder for me. Now hurry. Okay, just let me tuck her hands in. Roderick. Her eyelids. They flickered. She's coming too. It's Jeanette, my dear. Oh. Oh, what a pity. She's passed out again. Poor youngster. She... Roderick, did you notice the way she looked? Oh, just now, do you mean? Yes. She opened her eyes wide for a second or two. And it, it was as though she saw something that terrified her. But what? Roderick, there's someone out there. On the ledge. Coming this way. See who it is. Oh, Oh, it's Corrigan and Drury. Oh, yes, and Brain. Mrs. Corrigan's bringing up the rear. We found her, Corrigan. One of you will have the nearest party with a stretcher. She's alive. It won't be long now till we have her back at the hotel. Oh, thank heaven for that. Roderick. Hmm? I've only just realized that Roberta has only to recover enough to speak, and a man, a man staying at the hotel, is going to be charged with a double murder. I'm putting Constable Neil on to guard you, Lassie. The district nurse is away to a tricky maternity case on the other side of the island, so we'll not be seeing her before the morning. And that raises a question. Who's going to look after Miss Symes in the meantime? Do you know anything about nursing? Not much, I'm afraid. Uh, but enough, maybe, to keep an eye on Miss Symes. Well, I... Would you stay with her tonight and watch her for me? I'm willing enough to try, but surely there's someone more competent. Hasn't it struck you, Miss, that you are the only woman in the hotel who wasn't here at the time of the first murder? But, Inspector, you can't suspect a woman, sure. Maybe not, but Mrs. Corrigan and Mrs. Persimmon have husbands. And I want no one in that room the girl's in who's in any way involved. No one on any pretext whatsoever, you follow me? Uh, oh, uh, when I came down from having a look at Miss Symes, uh, Mrs. Persimmon and Mrs. Cowdery Simpson were attending to them. I understood you said you didn't want anyone near Robert who was in any way involved. Ah, uh, there's no danger with the two women there. Anyhow, Neil's around. Neil? Oh, the constable who's to be my watchdog. One of them, anyway. Sergeant Monroe and I will never be far away. How's Roberta now, Mrs. Cardi Simpson? There's not much change. We've made her as comfortable as can be. All we can do now is wait for the doctor. Does Inspector Mackenzie really expect the murderer to try and get in here? I wouldn't be knowing what the inspector thinks, ma'am. Oh, what do you think, Constable Neal? The murderer knows that if she talks, we've got him. Oh, I've been looking for you, Janet. I went out for a breath of fresh air. The doctor's examined her, hasn't he? Yes. How does he rate her chances? He seems to think she has a goodish chance. She's still unconscious, of course. I'm afraid so, Roderick. Well, there was nothing really I could usefully do, so I felt I was better out of the way. She's in your room, isn't she? Yes. Oh, where have they put you, Janet? Oh, I'm not moving rooms. The inspector wants me to stay there tonight. As a sort of night nurse. Sort of. But Janet, I'm not happy about you having to... I'll be all right, Roderick. Oh, does the inspector think there's still a threat to Roberta? I believe so. But Roberta will be safe enough. And by the same token, so will I. So don't worry. Oh, very well, then I won't. As a matter of fact, I have a hunch that you're the only person in the hotel who isn't endangered from the murderer. Roderick, I know how horrible it must be for all of you. This feeling that you're a suspect... 
I think I'd like a drink. Will you join me? So long as you let me buy you one. What will you have, Janet? Sherry, please. Medium. I'll get them from the bar. It saves time. Okay. I'll be in the lounge. I hope the police can protect that poor girl from the, the beast that's loose among us. Oh, there is a murderer in this room. You can't get away from that fact. Not necessarily, Mrs. Calder Simpson. Grant, Drury, Major Persimmon, not to mention James E. Farlane, aren't here. They lengthen the odds more than a little. I hope this is to your taste, Janet. Oh, you're back, Roderick. I didn't see you come in. Perhaps not for the brain. I am here now. How does that affect the odds? And what odds? Well, it seems we're beginning to take seriously the idea that someone in this hotel is a murderer. Drink okay, Janet? Yes, thanks. I imagine the police can be relied on to get on with their job. If they only look after Roberta Seidens properly, she'll do it for them. A police officer will be watching her all night, and I'm staying with her too. Actually, she's in my room. Won't you be frightened? I don't think so, Mrs. Corrigan. By the way, where's Mr. Drury? Gone to the garage, I think, to fetch a book from his car. Why so interested, Miss Brooke? Has the inspector asked you to spy on us? Oh, Mrs. Corrigan, it's... It's all right, Roderick. Mrs. Corrigan's suggestion isn't really so outrageous. I'm certainly cooperating with the police, as I hope we all are. And if that means giving the inspector an account of anyone's movements at any time, I'll do so. Good for you, Miss Brooke. I second that, Harry. Uh, once a man puts his hand to murder, he's automatically an outcast. That's a strong statement, sir. All the same, it's absurd that we should all be treated as suspects. The police must have some idea who did it. If they haven't now, they certainly will have as soon as Roberta Simes can speak. Oh, oh sorry. Oh, it's you, is it? Why, it's our little copper's knock. Don't you dare speak to me like that, Nicholas Drury. You've got me right. So, my sweet Giannetta, you keep telling me. Where were you going in such a hurry? It's none of your damned business. It's anyone's business in this murderous locality to stop you wandering about on your own. And where's your gallant with the golden hair? Why isn't he playing You bodyguard? always did have a nasty tongue. Yes, I did, didn't I? But I'm quite serious as it happens. You're altogether too fond of wandering about this place alone. Or with someone you don't really know. Aren't you scared? I wasn't until now. <laughs> so you're afraid I'll kill you, Giannetta Mia. Do you really think I'll do it, Giannetta? And all for what? Do you need a reason? What's your proof? I haven't any. If you had, would you hand me over? I... I don't know, Nicholas. You were my wife. I know that, but... You always used to say that you didn't believe in divorce. It wasn't my fault we got divorced. Even so, according to what you used to preach, you should still think of yourself as bound to me. Do you still? Now? Now? I don't follow. No. I was harking back to the blonde boyfriend. Damn you, Nicholas. Oh, you've got a tricky problem, haven't you, Giannetta? Loyalty versus civic duty. Or is it old love versus the new? It would simplify matters for you emotionally, I mean, if you could hand me over to the law this very minute. If I were still your wife, legally, I shouldn't help to incriminate you, even if I could. You see, as your wife, I'd feel identified with you in all you did. But I'd leave you. I couldn't stay with you, knowing that you were... Cain? Uh, yes. And as things are? As things are, I don't know, God damn you. Now, let me by. The uh, doctor left instructions, Miss Brooke. I've written them down for you. They're on the bedside table. Uh, mostly it's a matter of keeping the patient in the room warm. And the doctor's off to a confinement. But if there are any problems, I have to ring up the Broadford Hospital for advice. So if I'm worried about anything, I send Constable Neal for you. Uh, no, use the phone there. I'm occupying what was Miss Mayling's room. Uh, Constable, you know what you have to do, yes, don't you? Sir. Yes, sir. All right. Uh, Sergeant Monroe will relieve you at 2 a.m., and I'll be along now and again to make sure everything's in order. Uh, let me see. All right, the window. Uh, I see there's a mist coming down, a pity. Anyhow, that's the window snipped. Uh, you have a long night ahead of you, but a safe one, I hope. Oh, uh, one thing more. Major Persimmon will keep the generator running all night, so the lighting will be on. Try to get some rest, miss. Neil will let you know right away if Miss Simon stirs. Very well, Inspector. I'll say good night, then. Good night. Uh, Constable Neil. Sir, as soon as I go out, you'll lock the door. Understood? What is it, Sergeant? Roberta, oh, is she... Oh, she's scarcely stepped since you refilled the hot water bottles. 
But you were having a nightmare. You were muttering. And I thought you'd rather I woke you. I'm worried about the fire, too. What about the fire? It's all my stoutness. Oh, so we'd better get it going again. The doctor said the room must be kept warm. Ah. We should have asked Mrs. Persimmon for some wood to help us keep the fire going. Would I go and get some, then? I can't find where it's kept. When I was having a look around earlier on, I saw a pile in a shed at the back. Should you go, do you think? Well, either I go or that fire goes out. Well, if I turn the key in the door and don't open till you get back, there'll be no harm done. But I must be sure that it's you I open it for. I'll give a knock like this. Okay, Sergeant. Okay, Sergeant. That you, Sergeant Munro? No, it's Inspector Mackenzie. Unlock the door, lad. Just a minute, Inspector. I must finish remaking Roberta's bed. Mackenzie here. What is it? Quickly. He's at the door. Oh, hurry, hurry, please. Inspector, where the devil have you been, Sergeant, to get wounds, sir? Oh, your hand up, have you? No, Miss Brooke. Are you there? This is Inspector Mackenzie, and Sergeant Monroe is with me. Go on, man, tell her you're here. I wanted to be sure that there are two of us and that we're who we say we are. It's me, Miss, and I've got the wood. I'll knock. Okay, I'll unlock now. Uh, don't you touch that handle, nor this side of the door. Glad to see you, uh, Inspector. Here's at the door. The madness. Now, you sit down there, miss. It's all right. I'll hear all about it in a minute or two. Don't you bother trying to talk just yet. Oh. Sergeant, get the fingerprinting equipment from my room and get the outside of that door a good going over. Right, sir. Inspector Mackenzie, do you know who the murderer is? I could make a pretty good guess, but we've no real proof as yet. And if that lassie on the bed there doesn't tell us something soon, I'm afraid of what may happen next. You take tonight, for instance. He took a desperate chance and very nearly got away with it. He'll tempt his luck once too often. He's not just lucky, Miss Brooke. He's diabolically cool. Did you feel up to finishing your watch, Miss Brooke? Yes, of course. Good. But uh, don't send Sergeant Monroe away again for anything. I won't, Inspector. Have you something to help you pass the time, then? Mm, I found a book, Golden Bough. Golden Bough? Uh, isn't that about primitive religions? I wouldn't know. I'll not be on the end of the telephone, miss. I've one or two things to do, but don't worry. Sergeant Monroe will be back in a minute, and I'll not leave you till he comes. You're sure you'll get him, Inspector? Oh, yes. We'll get him. Uh, what is it, Miss Brooke? The Golden Bough. The book you saw me with last night. I put a marker in the bit I'd like you to read. Uh, Central Highlands Bonfires, 1st of May, Human Sacrifice, Island of Sky, Very Combustible... Where did you find this? In the lounge. And when did you read this passage? Last night, after you'd gone. I was just browsing through. Do you know whose book this was? I... Uh, no. Uh, you had other things to tell me, I believe. Uh, no, Miss Brooke, what was it you thought I ought to know? The cut climbing rope. Yes. On my first night here, I lay awake for hours. I came downstairs to the lounge in search of my handbag. While I was there, I spoke to Alistair Brain. But before that, I'd heard someone in the porch, almost certainly James Farland. Well, Alistair told me then that Mr. Corrigan had been fishing with them and had already come back to the hotel. Later, his wife said he didn't get in until three o'clock, but it was half past two when I spoke to Alistair Brain. What you're really trying to tell me is that each of these three men, Farland, Brain and Corrigan, had the opportunity to tamper with the women's climbing ropes on the night before the climb. Yes, I suppose so. Then where does Dougal McRae's third climber come in? He might be innocent and just be frightened. Hmm. Had you anything more to tell me? 
Well, there was Miss Mayling's doll. Oh, but maybe you know about it. Yes, I do, as it happens. Mrs. Corrigan told me about it. She did it to frighten Miss Mayling away from the hotel for, uh, well, for reasons of her own. Well, it appears to have worked. Quite so. Is there anything else? No, Inspector. You're lying to me, aren't you? No. Lassie, Lassie, I think you told me a lie last night, didn't you? A lie? You <laughs> said you hadn't guessed who the murderer was. Do you really believe that a woman of Marion Bradford's experience wouldn't have noticed that the rope was damaged when she put it on? Do you really think that the rope was damaged in the hotel porch that night? No. I'll tell you how we think this murder was done. You realize, of course, that Roberta Symes never climbed this putandu at all. No? Well, you found her. Was there a rope in her body? No. No, there wasn't. Of course, I see it now. If she'd been middle man on the rope, the murderer couldn't have cut it between her and Marion. We think he contrived to meet Marion Bradford and the girl on Blavan. He suggested doing the climb with Miss Bradford, Roberta being left to spectate. When he got Miss Bradford out of sight... He could cut the rope then without, be, without being seen. Just so. From where she was watching, Roberta Symes would see what appeared to be an accident, her friend falling. Then she would hear him shout that he was coming back. She, meanwhile, would wait for him in who knows what agony of mind. And in turn, as he planned it, he'd throw her down. Oh, no. It... If a man's a murderer, lassie, he doesn't deserve to be defended. But loyalty... Your loyalty is to the rest of us. Even if I had guessed who the murderer was, it would only be a guess. What more can I do to help you catch him? I've told you everything. Uh, no, you haven't, Miss Brooke. And if you're holding back the evidence I need, then I must warn you. I haven't any evidence. I swear I haven't. And if I had... Oh, my God, I must get out of here. I've got to have time to think. Uh, good morning, ma'am. I, I was hoping to have a word with you, but if you're in a hurry, then... Good morning, Dougal. A hurry? No, well, that is... Well, I, I, it was today I was taking you fishing, Miss uh, Brooke. Uh, had you forgotten? Fishing? I, I'm sorry, but it, it seems odd to be thinking about fishing after all this. Oh, uh, to be sure it does. Uh, but you'll be better out in the, in the clean air fishing and taking your mind off things. You can take my word for it, ma'am. What's the weather going to be like? No, well, it's fine now, but uh, there could be a bit of mist coming in off the sea later on. Can I take time for a cigarette, Dougal? Oh, of course, my son. I'll have a draw at my pipe. Oh, you've no objections. Heavens, no. <laughs> have as many drawers as you like. Now, oh, where's my package? Too many pockets. That's my trouble. Oh, damn. Roberta's brooch. I meant to hand it over to Inspector McKenzie. I must... Where did you get this? Oh, up near the Sprout and Do. Miss Symes must that have dropped it. brooch belonged to my daughter. Oh. That just given it to her for her birthday and she was wearing it for the first time when when she went out that night you you, you give it to the inspector and you tell him where you found it god knows it won't help my lassie know but it might help him well if we don't catch anything now we won't have the excuse that it was too bright i don't think we're in the mood to carry on fishing anyway rotten mists getting thicker while we're talking. Oh, don't you worry about it, monsieur. Just you bide where you are till I get our tackle from where we left it. Oh, if you can find it. No, I'll manage. I'll just have to walk along the bank till I come to it. You bloody murdering bastard. What is it doing? Run, lassie. Run. Run. Oh, Roderick warned. Sink if you stand still. Must keep moving. Gianetta. Gianetta. Only Nicholas calls me that. Are you there, Gianetta? Don't be afraid. Don't answer. Not let him know where. Oh, thank God. Thank God I'm out of the mist. Thank heaven. Janet? Oh, 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 Janet. <laughs> Oh, you can't imagine. <laughs> oh, Janet, Janet, just sit down. Get this boulder. Take off your coat. It's soaked through. I'll be okay in a minute, Roderick. Oh, you, you know, don't you? Yes, I know. 
But back there with the mist all round, Nicholas was hunting me down But to... I told you you were safe from him. I was wrong, though. It was wrong of me to try to protect him once I suspected that he was what he is. Why did you? Because I'm his wife. Were his wife, Janet? Loyalty dies hard. Why talk about loyalty when you mean love? That's it, isn't it? I, I suppose so. What exactly happened? The mist closed in. We'd left our rods and other bits and pieces down on the bank, and Dougal had gone to collect them. There was sounds of a struggle. I got in a panic and ran. While I was floundering about, I heard him calling Giannetta. He was within yards of me at times. He must know that you've guessed who, what he is. I should think so. How far away? Only minutes ago, since he was far too close. Hmm. Come on. On your feet. Here, let me give you a pull-up. We're above the mist now. Shouldn't we wait till we till it clears all the way down? We're not going down. We're going up. What do you mean, Roderick? I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Now, don't ask questions, do as I say. Are you putting on your coat? No, I'll carry it. It's really too wet. Oh, let me have it then. Here. Oh, thanks. Oh, I, I must get my handkerchief out of the pocket. Here, you pulled something else out. What's this, Janet? Oh, brooch. It was Heather McRae's. Uh-huh. I found it yesterday near that dreadful ledge. I thought it was Roberta's, but today Dougal McRae recognized it as his daughter's. Oh, my God. What's wrong, Janet? You told me about the little pile of jewelry found on the ledge. You told me about it when you were describing Heather's murder. A bracelet, you said, and a brooch and other things. But the brooch wasn't on the ledge when the body was found. And since she'd only been given it that day for her birthday... You couldn't have known about it unless you'd seen her wearing it. Unless you, yourself, put it on the ledge beside the bonfire. What a pity you remembered. So it wasn't Nicholas. You were the killer. I really am sorry, Janet. I knew when I overheard you talking to Dougal McRae back there by the river that sooner or later you'd remember about the brooch, but... I'd no intention of killing you. But of course I'll have to now. No, don't try and make a run for it. And don't scream, Janet, because then I'll have to throttle you and... Well, I always cut their throats if I can. It's the best way. Why did you kill Heather McRae? They wanted it. They? The mountains. A life, a year. That's what they need. They must have the May Day sacrifice they received when the world was young... And when men knew that gods lived on the mountains. Hmm. Now, together we collected the nine woods, the algorithm and the oak, to make the wild fire. She helped me to build it. Then I cut her throat. But and... why did you kill Marion Bradford? The little one talked sacrilege, chattering about conquering Everest. Impudence. Mm, Bradford was no better. <laughs> that, that was quite easy. That dreadful, stupid woman was a little bit in love with me. She was delighted when I met them up by the Spoot and Do and offered to show her the climb across it. I suppose you thought they were both dead when you left them. They should have been. Wasn't it bad luck? I'd been along that ledge three times already. Never occurred to me that she'd reached that little cave. Anyhow, you found her. I did. Yet you nearly gave me the chance I wanted, Janet. When you asked me to go for your flask? Yeah, a little pressure on the throat and... But you came back too soon. That explains. What? While I was trying to make her comfortable, she opened her eyes. She seemed to be looking at someone beyond me and was terrified. For an instant, I thought it might have been Nicholas who'd found his way into the cave, but it was you she saw. She knew that you were the kid. Of course she knew, Janet. But you were so sure Drury had killed the Bradford creature and Beagle. Why Beagle? Uh, at night, on the mountainside, he wouldn't stop talking about Everest having been conquered, as he put it. Everest! Snows defiled and trampled, but I'd hoped no human being would ever set his sacrilegious feet. You said that, Janet, do you remember? You spoke about Everest like that, and because you did, I thought I could never hurt you. But Beagle, I followed him downhill, caught him from behind, and killed him. Now, my knife. Where is it? I was sharpening it on a stone. I put it down somewhere. There it is, Roderick. On the ground, just behind you. Well, I don't see it. <laughs> Janet, come back. You won't get away. That ledge, that ledge. Must reach that ledge. Come down here, Janet. 
Come down here, Janet. You are trapped. <sighs> Very well, I shall have to come up. Keep away. There are plenty of stones here, big ones. Stay where you are. I'll smash your head in. A piece of rock would smash my skull. You couldn't do a thing like that, could you? No, I can't. I can't. I can't. I thought not, Janet. <laughs> Don't worry, Janetta. I can. Nicholas, I'm perfectly all right now. Tell me, please, what happened when you caught him? Well, he put up a pretty desperate struggle, and I shouldn't like to bet on what the outcome might have been if Sergeant Munro and his sidekick hadn't arrived on the scene. That's a nasty cut on your cheek. Oh, I'll live. Ah, here comes the law in all its majesty. <laughs> Hello, Inspector. I'm far off as good as. We're just waiting for transport to take us and the accused back to Inverness. Are you quite recovered, Miss Brooke? Quite, thank you. Ah, good. Well, it would seem I was wrong in thinking that you were withholding vital evidence. But what did you imagine I knew that I hadn't told you? I thought you'd recognize the man you saw in front of the bonfire. I hadn't. I believe you now. Even so, I could have sworn you were lying about something. I was, but not about that. Uh, concerning Mr. Drury, I suspect. No, it doesn't matter, no. Take care of her, sir. She's had a rough time. I will, inspect her. Oh, by the way, Mr. Drury, I hope you've a license for that gun of yours. Uh, now I'll uh, say goodbye to you both. Goodbye, Inspector McKenzie. Uh, bye, Inspector. <laughs> My oh. God, you had me worried, Giannetta. The Inspector had put Neil on to watch Grant, but the mist came down and Grant gave him the slip. I knew where you and Dougal were fishing, so I made my way up river. I heard a yell from Dougal, so I ran like blazes. I found your rods, but you'd gone. I started a frantic search for you, which landed me in that damn bog. I know, I heard you. I was scared out of my wits. I thought you were the murderer. And you didn't help by calling in such a sinister way. Well, I didn't want him to reach you before I could. So you knew then that it was Roderick? So did Inspector Mackenzie, but there was no proof. What was the information the inspector was waiting for from London? It concerns Roderick Grant's family. His mother died when he was born, and his grandmother, his father's mother, brought him up. Then she died in an asylum. Oh, Nicholas, how dreadful. So his father's family... Exactly. His father had always been a stern, God-fearing Presbyterian. His son only mattered to him as someone to whom he could pour out his cranky theories about customs and legends of the Highlands and Islands. Grant must have spent a large part of his childhood listening to his father's garbled versions of the old folklore, of which the so-called ritual murder of Heather McRae was the eventual spin-off. I know, I found some of the bits in the Golden Bough. Uh, my Golden Bough, which you handed to the inspector. Uh, what, I wonder, would you have done had you known it was mine? But I did know it was yours, Nicholas. There was an envelope inside it addressed to you in Daddy's handwriting. By the way, how come that Daddy knew you were here? Well, I remember that he had the books I phoned to ask if he'd send it on to me. You see, Grant had made one or two remarks that struck me as being half-remembered quotes from the Golden Bough. When I saw how the author's details checked with poor Heather McRae's May Day sacrifice... May Day? Well, May 13th is May Day, according to the old calendar. Well, everything fitted in a bizarre sort of way. So I showed the book to Inspector Mackenzie. When? Last week. And you knew the book was yours? Of course. Did he never suspect you? Well, he may have done to begin with, along with Hubert Hay and Grant. You see, Hay and I had both displayed some knowledge of local folklore. Hay, however, had an alibi provided by you in the case of Marion Bradford's murder, and I had indicated my innocence by putting the police on the right track by the Golden Bough. So that left Grant. Then why did the inspector seem so sorry for me when he was lecturing me about loyalties? You assume, don't you, that he was lecturing you because he thought you were being loyal to me? Roderick I'd seen by the bonfire. Exactly. He was pretty sure by then that Grant was the murderer, and he suspected you of shielding him because you'd fallen for him. I'm afraid I told him so on the uh, scant evidence of Roderick Grant's marked interest in you. You told the inspector I was in love with Grant? I did. Sorry, Jeanetta. Sheer dog in the manger stuff. Jealousy exaggerates, you know. So when you seemed to be holding back evidence about Grant, Mackenzie took it that you yourself suspected him, but was loath to give him away. That's absurd. I thought he had bags of charm. I wasn't in love with him. Oh, why not? We'll skip that, if you don't mind. <laughs> when did the inspector finally decide that Roderick Grant was his man? Brain, Corrigan, Persimmon, or Beagle could have had an unacknowledged interest in folklore. But Marion's murder narrowed the field down appreciably, since it pointed clearly to the fact that the murderer was a first-rate climber. Now, Beagle was the only one of that lot who was, and it wasn't long until he was murdered. So that... Left Roderick? Yes. Yeah. Trouble was to pin anything on him. Roberta, of course, could have provided more than enough evidence. 
But there was also the chance that she'd have mercifully forgotten all about the whole ugly episode. Mackenzie phoned London asking for information about Grant. He was going to risk pulling him in if they came up with anything that would give him a pretext for doing so. This morning, word came back that Grant's father died in a mental home two years ago. Oh, no. Well, that, of course, was quite enough to warrant his being detained. But that damned mist rolled in from the sea like curtains. Grant managed to give Constable Neil the slip and go hounding after you. Oh, Gianetta, what a risk you ran. Dougal didn't hurt him, did he? No, he arrived on the scene hell-bent on revenge, but he calmed down when he saw Grant. Why? Grant had gone to pieces. I just hit him on the jaw, hard. Yet there he was smiling at me like a bewildered child and wiping the blood away. He just stood smiling at us. Dougal said, come on, laddie, and he went quite happily with them. Then he started to sing. Sing? Well, croon, sort of. I to the hills will lift mine eyes from whence doth come mine aid. Oh, the poor crazy devil. Poor Roderick Grant. You did see me, didn't you, in the corridor with Marcia Mailing? Yes. I want you to know that in this instance I was more kissed than kissing. All night? Meaning what, Giannetta? I passed Marcia Mailing's room during the night. I heard voices and one was a man's. I see. Well, I didn't spend the night with her. I merely got myself momentarily, um, how shall I put it, waylaid. Mm. I should think the man you heard was Hartley Corrigan. That's why he came back early from fishing that night. Yet Alma Corrigan said he didn't get to bed until three o'clock. Well, well. Evidently, he'd found his way to another bed before that. Poor Alma. Oh, I think the worst over for them, too. And now, shall we talk about us? No, I... don't speak. I want you back, Gianetta. I do most damnably want you back. I do love you, my darling. I don't think I ever stopped loving you. Have me back. Please. I never did have any pride, so far as you were concerned, Nicholas. You know, it wasn't just coincidence that I met you here. When your father told me you were due a holiday... Don't ever leave me again, Nicholas. I don't think I could bear it. Never again. What do you bet? That when we arrive at Ten Jabbers, Mother will meet us as though nothing had ever happened and show us to the spare room. Then we'd better get married again before we get there. Midnight was adapted by Stuart Hunter from the novel by Mary Stuart. The part of Giannetta... There's nothing wrong that a short holiday won't cure. Hugo thinks I should take myself off to some quiet spot. It was played by Ursula Smith. Roderick Grant... I'd no intention of killing you. But of course I'll have to now. By Stephen MacDonald. And Nicholas... Ah, here comes the law in all its majesty. <laughs> Hello, Inspector. By Roy Boucher. Marcia. Its roots been cut and there's ash scattered over it. The murderer has been here. It was played by Claire Richards. Dougal. He was wearing it for the first time when when she went out that night. By Murder MacDonald. And the inspector. The uh, doctor left instructions, Miss Brooke. I've written them down for you. They're on the bedside table. By John Shedden. Alistair was played by Derek Gilbert. Hubert and Corrigan by Brian Carey. Mrs. Corrigan, Gertrude Bryce, Mrs. Brooke and Marion, Thelma Barlow, Roberta, Sally Farrell, Beagle, Arthur Boland, Persimmon, Clement Ashby, and Police Sergeant, Charles Batiste. Wildfire at Midnight was produced in our Glasgow studios by Stuart Conn.